Hey everyone, today we are looking into the lives of three remarkable 19th century individuals that were previously covered on the channel. These were some of my favourite and most liked videos percentage wise, so I really hope you do enjoy. For our first story, we are going back to early 19th century United States. The woman who would later become known as the Great Western, as well as a range of different surnames, had a birth which was as mythical as later aspects of her life. It is not entirely clear when she was born, or indeed where, though most accounts tend to agree that she first came into the world sometime between 1812 and 1818, somewhere in the region where the Midwest meets the South, on the border between Missouri and Tennessee. She may have been born as Sarah Knight to an Irish American family, which given this surname and place of birth, would suggest she hailed from a family of Scottish-Irish emigrants who had arrived to the American South in the 18th century, from Ulster in the north of Ireland. The shadowy circumstances of her birth are mirrored in accounts of her childhood and early adult years. We know little about her upbringing, and while she later claimed to have been born into a respectable family of good prospects, we can be sure that she was illiterate and could not read or write, an indication that she received very little, if any, formal education. From early in her life, she began to grow to an unusually large size. Eventually, she stood over six feet tall, some accounts placing her as being six foot two inches and weighing nearly 200 pounds as an adult. Despite her size, she was deemed to be an attractive woman, though one whose physical presence was always imposing, and some also even claimed that she had an hourglass figure. It was her size which eventually earned her the nickname the Great Western. This was taken from the SS Great Western, a British ship which in the 1830s became the first paddle wheel steamship purpose-built for making transatlantic voyages which passed regularly between England and New York. Sarah's life of adventure on the frontiers of America began around the same time that the SS Great Western began making its voyages across the Atlantic in the 1830s. Having married a soldier whose name has not survived, Sarah joined the US Army camp followers during the Second Seminole War. This was fought between the United States government and the Seminole Indians of Florida between 1835 and 1842. Sarah's role as a camp follower would have either been as a cook, laundress, or some other functional role in the upkeep of the military camp. The campaign in Florida was led by General Zachary Taylor, a man who would soon become the President of the United States, but before that led the US in one of its most significant wars of the 19th century. This occurred on the border with Mexico and the outbreak of the conflict drew Sarah to Texas, from where we begin to get a much clearer idea of her life and actions. The Mexican-American War, which broke out in 1846, was caused by the disputed position of Texas on the border between the United States and the relatively new state of Mexico. Texas had formed part of Spanish Mexico for centuries, but when Mexico achieved its independence from Spain in the 1820s, the position of Texas became more controversial. As a result, in 1836, Texas broke away from Mexico and declared its independence as a new Republic of Texas. But this proved short-lived, and less than 10 years later in 1845, the region was formally annexed by the US. Mexico, though, was unwilling to accept this new state of affairs, particularly the American argument that the border between the US and Mexico should be located at Rio Grande. The government in Mexico wished for the frontier to be established further north at the Nueces River, and it was the dispute over this which eventually led to the outbreak of the Mexican-American War in 1846. Sarah soon distinguished herself on the border in the opening days of the war. The first clash between the Mexican and US troops occurred at the Arroyo Colorado River in Texas on the 21st of March 1846. Here, she offered to wade the river and attack the Mexicans herself, 
earning her a fiery reputation amongst her troops and camp followers. She was also remarried by now, her second husband being a Mr. Borgini or Borghini, probably an individual of French descent from Louisiana or the surrounding region where French settlement had been considerable in the 17th and 18th centuries. He was a soldier in the 5th Infantry Division, and so her life as a camp follower continued. In the weeks and months that followed, the Great Western earned a considerable reputation as a camp follower at Fort Brown in Texas. Here she ran a canteen for the officers, and gained some notoriety for her fearlessness when the garrison came under siege in May 1846. By this time, many stories of Sarah began to spread. She possessed an excellent set of skills. This can be seen when a Texas Ranger, John Salmon Ford, said of her, She could whip any man, fair fight or foul. She could shoot a pistol better than anyone in the region, and that blackjack could outplay or outcheat the slickest professional gambler. Newspaper men as far away as New York and Philadelphia conveyed stories about the war in the southwest back to the more settled east coast and wrote about the heroine of Fort Brown, who audaciously insisted on serving the troops three meals a day on the front lines as artillery exploded around her, and who even carried a musket on her person in case the fort was stormed by Mexicans. That same fort was never breached, and as the tide of the war turned against the Mexicans, the camp followers moved south along with the US Army. The Great Western went with them, and saw subsequent action at the Battle of Buena Vista in northern Mexico as a consequence, in February 1847. Thereafter, she established a hotel in Saltillo, in the northern Mexican state of Coahuila. Here she provided meals and lodgings for soldiers, on their way to and from the front. She would remain there for the rest of the war, but ever having itchy feet, by the summer of 1848, shortly after the end of hostilities, she was requesting to be allowed to head west towards California. Meanwhile, the wider Mexican-American War ended in a complete disaster for Mexico. Having quickly secured the border region, US forces under General Winfield Scott advanced into Mexico itself early in 1847, and eventually occupied Mexico City. With this utter defeat, Mexico was forced to accept the US terms. Under the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, signed in February 1848, Mexico was forced to accept the US annexation of Texas, and to recognize the Rio Grande as the border between the two countries. As such, the conclusion of the Mexican-American War saw the establishment as Texas as part of the United States, and the modern-day border between Mexico and the US. With the war over, Sarah was soon on the move again. As we have seen, in 1848, she was stationed at Saltillo in northern Mexico, but with the end of the war, she had sought permission to head out west to California. There were numerous reasons for this. Her second husband seems to have been killed in the closing stages of the war with Mexico, and she found herself widowed. Also, the western frontier seemed an inviting prospect. Early in 1848, large gold reserves had been discovered out in California. This resulted in a mass migration of prospectors and others seeking economic opportunity to the West in the six or seven years that followed. Known euphemistically as the 49ers, as many as 300,000 individuals headed out to California by the mid-1850s, amongst them many former soldiers and camp followers from the war. In the process, tens of thousands of adventurers set up villages and towns between Texas and California, acting as supply stations and settlements in their own right. The Great Western was amongst those who moved into this region. In 1849, Sarah arrived in El Paso in the far west of Texas. Here she briefly established a hotel which catered for the many 49ers traveling out west to seek their fortune in the gold fields of California. The so-called hotel is generally understood to have doubled as a saloon and a brothel, the first of many associations between Sarah and such establishments in the American West in the years that followed. Though it is still a matter of debate 
as to whether the Great Western ran these establishments solely, or if she herself also worked as a prostitute. The nature of the hotel in El Paso is especially controversial, as Sarah quickly sold up to the US military and moved on again to Socorro, New Mexico. A further brothel was no doubt established here, at least that is the impression conveyed when we learn that Sarah was presiding over an establishment in Socorro with five orphan girls. She also married for a third time while in town. Her new and final husband was the only one for whom we have a full name. He was Albert J. Bowman, an upholsterer from Germany who had enlisted as a soldier in the US Army and had been stationed as a dragoon in Socorro as one of the many servicemen appointed to the garrisons along the routes to California in the late 1840s and early 1850s. Given the ambiguities about her own birth name and those of her first two husbands, his surname of Bowman is that which has generally been applied to the Great Western. When Albert was discharged from the military late in 1850, he and Sarah renewed their nomadic ways, eventually reaching Fort Yuma. A considerable military station had been established here in the 1850s, on the triangular border between the newly formed state of California, the border with Mexico, and what would one day become the state of Arizona. In the months and years that followed, the Great Western lived on either sides of the border here, at one time serving yet again as a company laundress at Fort Yuma, and at other times dwelling in Mexico, as Albert found gold prospecting opportunities over the border. In these later years, Sarah developed into one of Southern Arizona's most prominent business people, setting up additional restaurants and saloons when a new military garrison was settled at Fort Buchanan in 1856. While some of these were respectable establishments, it is almost certain that she had become the overseer of a network of brothels in Arizona by the late 1850s. There is concrete evidence to indicate that she was running a brothel in the small mining town of Fort Crittenden by this time, and in 1856 we find the Lieutenant Sylvester Morey, who passed through the area writing to a friend of his about Sarah, declaring that, among her other good qualities, she is quite an admirable pimp. By 1864, Albert and she had divorced, though this did not disrupt her business activity and she continued to adopt several orphans and Native American girls, teaching them to support themselves by doing cooking and laundry. The Great Western eventually died on the 22nd of December 1866 from a venomous spider bite, perhaps being as little as 48 years of age, though more likely in her early 50s. She was buried in the cemetery at Fort Yuma the following day with full military honours. She had a peculiar life. On the one hand, she could be criticised for acting as a pimp to dozens of young women from Texas, west through to New Mexico to Arizona and Eastern California. But on the other hand, she was surviving as best she could in the harsh frontier region of America in the 19th century, and was teaching others who had come from disadvantaged backgrounds how to do the same. But whichever way she is looked at and remembered, there is no doubting that she was one of the most formidable frontierswomen of the southern United States, as the age of the American West was just beginning. For our next story, we will be going back to mid 19th century United States, but this time to the American Midwest. Phoebe Ann Mosey, known famously as Annie Oakley, was born on the 13th of August 1860 in a very rural part of Ohio. Her parents, Susan and Jacob Mosey, were Quakers of English descent. As a young girl, Annie lived on a farm with her parents and her numerous brothers and sisters in Dark County, Ohio. When Annie was just five years old, she began trapping birds and other small animals, which provided extra food for her family. Despite coming from an impoverished household, some of the happiest times of her life included trapping and hunting in the nearby fields and woods. During the winter of 1865, Annie's father headed into town to buy certain supplies he needed for the farm. However, during the journey a strong blizzard kicked up, leading to him getting hypothermia. In the following months, Jacob became very sick and was unable to care for himself. 
He eventually died as a result of his illnesses in March 1866, aged 67. Annie's mother Susan was now a widow and had to look after seven children without having the means to do so. Due to this, the family moved to a smaller home and most of the children couldn't attend school regularly. Instead, they all worked hard to provide for each other. In the evenings, Annie's mother Susan would gather the children to sing hymns and pray. For her, it was important to instill Quaker values into her kids. Despite young Annie being good at trapping, one day she decided to use her father's old muzzle-loading gun in hopes of providing even more food for her family. She was just seven years old at the time. It soon became apparent that she was a natural-born sharpshooter. Despite Annie's success, the family was soon again plunged deep into poverty after the death of her eldest sister. The medical and funeral expenses meant food was scarce and money was short. As a result, some of Susan's children were temporarily taken care of by other families. On the 15th of March, 1870, Annie, along with her sister Ellen, moved to the Dark County Infirmary, where they were taught to sew, decorate, and helped to look after the younger children. Annie was just nine at the time. Around three weeks later, a man came to the infirmary asking for a young girl to keep his wife company and help look after their infant son. According to the man, nothing else was required of whoever accepted. As well as this, they would receive an education and 50 cents per week, about $10 today. With her mother's permission, Annie went to work for the family. According to her, the first month was fine, but after that, she was heavily exploited. In her autobiography, Annie stated that, I got up at four o'clock in the morning, got breakfast, milked the cows, fed the calves, the pigs, pumped water for the cattle, fed the chickens, rocked the baby to sleep, weeded the garden, picked wild blackberries, got dinner after digging the potatoes for dinner and picking the vegetables, and then could go hunting and trapping. Of course, by now Annie wanted to go home, but she couldn't. The two adults whom she referred to as the wolves forced her to stay, essentially enslaving her. They even wrote letters to her mother, stating that she was happy and attending school. The constant abuse endured by Annie reached new heights when on one occasion she fell asleep over a big basket of stockings. Upon seeing Annie asleep, Mrs. Wolf struck her on the ear, pinched her arm and as punishment, locked her outside in the freezing snow. Within minutes, Annie, who had no shoes on, felt her feet go numb. She later described how she got on her knees, looked up at the sky and prayed to God. But as her lips were frozen shut, there was no sound. Annie was just 10 years old at the time. In the spring of 1872, after almost two years with the wolves, Annie finally ran away. She made her way to a train depot but as she had no money, she couldn't make her way home. Luckily, a kind man was willing to hear Annie's story, later buying her food and a ticket home. Worryingly, the wolves tracked Annie, and one day, the he-wolf, as Annie called him, turned up at her school. Fortunately, he was turned away by a large man that Annie knew, and he never returned. This experience as a child led Annie to be selfless later in life. Regarding this, she stated, If I spend one dollar foolishly, I see tear-stained faces for little children beaten, as I was. Back home, Annie continued hunting with a rifle and was soon supporting her whole family. She became an exceptional markswoman, and the excess game she killed was sold to a merchant called Charles Kanzenberger, who distributed it to restaurants and hotels all over Ohio. By the time she was 15, she had saved enough money to pay off the mortgage on their family home. As time passed, her shooting prowess made her known throughout the state. In the spring of 1881, the Boffman and Butler Shooting Act was being performed in Cincinnati. The show's main star was the Irish-American marksman Frank E. Butler. While in the city, Frank made a bet with a hotel owner, Jack Frost, 
that he could beat any local shooter. Jack Frost received information that an outstanding unknown marksman would challenge Frank, and so he accepted the bet. The match was promptly arranged, and Frank Butler would meet his contestant just 10 days later with a bet of $100 per side. It was in a little town near Greenville that Frank met young Annie. Of course, Frank was surprised and even laughed when he saw that his contestant was a young girl who was just five feet tall. Throughout the match, the two were tied, hitting every single bird. However, Frank missed his 25th shot, giving Annie the victory. Not long after, the two became close and married just a year after. It should be stated that there's lots of debate about the year of the match, as well as the marriage. Many sources claim that the match took place in 1875, when Annie was just 15, and that the couple married in August 1876. However, a marriage certificate states that they were wed on the 20th of June 1882 in Windsor, Ontario. In any case, the couple first performed together in a show on the 1st of May 1882. Initially, Frank was the star, always showcasing his talents. Meanwhile, Annie was in the background. Annie's first big break came when she replaced her husband's usual partner, who was ill. It was during this time that she adopted the stage name Oakley, which the world would later know her by. Yet in private, she was Mrs. Frank Butler. Over the next few years, the pair traveled around the US with crowds coming from all over to watch their shooting exhibitions. The couple also had a dog named George, who was essential to the act. In March 1884, Sitting Bull, a Native American leader, saw Annie Oakley perform in St. Paul, Minnesota. Impressed by her skills, the leader met her after the show. In time, the two became friends and had great respect for each other, with Sitting Bull later symbolically adopting her as he had lost a daughter at the Battle of Little Bighorn. He also gave her the nickname Little Sure Shot, which would be used in public advertisements for years to come. In 1885, Frank Butler and Annie Oakley joined Buffalo Bill's Wild West show. Up until now, Butler was the main performer, earning more than Oakley. However, this changed once they joined the Wild West. Oakley was on all the posters, being labelled as the champion markswoman. Once it was clear that Oakley was to be the show's star, Butler primarily worked as her manager and assistant. Yet, in 1886, an even younger female sharpshooter joined the show, becoming Oakley's direct rival. Lillian Smith was just 15 at the time, almost as good as Oakley, and began to receive favourable press coverage. It was likely due to this that Oakley made people believe that she was 20 years old at the time, when in reality, she was 26. In 1887, Queen Victoria celebrated her Golden Jubilee. Entertainment was needed for this grand event, and the Wild West show was invited to perform. The production arrived in England and began performing in May 1887. Oakley's skills were on the top of her game, and as a result, she received favourable press. The English papers were quick to highlight her incredible talents, as well as her intriguing Western background. While in England, she became somewhat of a celebrity, especially in shooting circles. Oakley received numerous gifts and was invited to many social events. Once the Wild West show left England, the production toured Europe, performing in France, Italy and Spain. During this time, Oakley exhibited her skills in front of European royalty and heads of state. One legend surrounding Oakley's life is that while in Europe, she shot the ashes of the German Kaiser Wilhelm II's cigarette while it was in his mouth. In truth, the cigarette was in the Kaiser's hand. The European tour cemented Oakley as America's first female star. She was the face of the Wild West show and earned more than any other performer. For many years, Oakley continued to perform as a sharpshooter for the Wild West show fascinating audiences with her stunts. Some of her best tricks included shooting cigarettes from her husband's lips 
and dimes from his hand. She was also able to shoot while standing on a galloping horse and make holes through cards before they landed on the ground. Oakley also knew how to shoot small targets from long distances while using a mirror. In November 1894, Oakley and Butler performed in one of the world's first ever films. It was called The Little Sure Shot of the Wild West and it was created with Edison's kinetoscope in his studio, the Black Maria. In 1898, Oakley wrote a letter to President William McKinley offering the government the services of a company of 50 lady sharpshooters who would provide their own arms and ammunition should the US go to war with Spain. Oakley was a strong advocate of women's rights and promoted the service of women in the armed forces. Although the war broke out, her offer was rejected. In 1901, Oakley was in a train accident that left her extremely injured. As a result, she had to undergo five spinal operations. Fortunately, she recovered. The following year, she left the Buffalo Bill show and started acting in the stage play, The Western Girl. After years of performing as a sharpshooter, she finally decided to retire in 1913. She settled down with her husband in Cambridge, Maryland. During their retirement, the butlers passed time by hunting and fishing. They were also active members in the local community and were liked by all, especially when they performed to raise money for the county fair. While in retirement, the butlers did a lot of traveling, especially to the south of the US. Although they liked Cambridge, in 1917, they sold their home and moved to Pinehurst, North Carolina. When the First World War broke out, Oakley wrote to Henry L. Stimson, the Secretary of War, offering to teach soldiers how to shoot accurately, as well as to fund and raise a regiment of women volunteers to fight. Nevertheless, both her offers were rejected. In 1922, despite being over 60 years old, Annie continued to set records and even performed to huge crowds in many major cities. She was eager to star in a new film and had various projects planned out. However, in November of the same year, a nasty car crash led to her being in critical condition. As a result, she had to wear a steel brace on her right leg and it took her almost a year to fully recover. However, recover she did and by the end of 1923, she was shocking crowds with her incredible precision as she had done her whole life. Despite being 63 years of age, some considered Annie Oakley to still be the greatest marksman in the world. Sadly, by 1925, Annie Oakley's health started to go downhill. In order to be closer to her family, she and her husband moved back to Annie's hometown of Greenville. Annie Oakley died on the 3rd of November 1926, aged 66, due to a pernicious anemia. She was later cremated and her ashes were buried at Brock Cemetery near Greenville. Butler died just three weeks later. Apparently, following his wife's death, he grieved so much that he stopped eating. He was buried next to her ashes. Annie Oakley is believed to have taught more than 15,000 women how to use a gun over her life. She said, I would like to see every woman know how to handle guns as naturally as they know how to handle babies. After her death, it was noted just how generous Oakley was with her money. Large parts of her wealth were sent to her relatives in Ohio, especially her numerous nieces and nephews. She also donated money to many orphans and charities. Annie Oakley's life has inspired many books, TV shows, films and plays. She is widely remembered as a Western folk hero and American legend. For our last story, we will once again be going back to mid 19th century USA, but this time to the American Northeast. Kimball Bent was born on the 24th of August, 1837 in Maine, USA. His parents were John Bent, a shipbuilder and carpenter, and Eliza Bagley. Bent was the fourth child out of seven. Little information regarding Bent's adolescence exists, and it's worthy to note the little evidence supporting the events of his life. Except from his own testimony, 
which was produced in 1903. There is also consensus within the information detailing his life that Bent was undoubtedly a liar, both in his youth to save his own skin and later in life to retrieve his reputation. Bent had always been desperately keen to have adventures out at sea and wished for more than the life that he was living in Maine. Consequently, Bent ran away from home at 17 and shipped on the training frigate Martin with the hopes of becoming a US Navy sailor. Bent spent three years traveling the Atlantic, catching the attention of his seniors and later becoming a successful young sailor and gunner. Bent, from the rank of seaman, graduated to a deckman. It was part of his training during the final year of his service to instruct the boys who came aboard as recruits in the working of the muzzle loading six pounder and eight pounder guns. Following his three year tenure aboard the training frigate Martin, Kimball Bent was paid off and he returned to Maine. However, upon returning to Maine, Bent was still restless for adventure and set sail for Liverpool, England, where he had a desire to make a life for himself in the old world. But not long after arriving in Liverpool, Bent found himself, by his own account, penniless through his own drinking habits. With nowhere else to turn and desperate for money, Kimball Bent enlisted in the 57th West Middlesex Regiment of Foot in the British Army on the 18th of October, 1859. After he enlisted, Bent, with a draft of 200 other willing recruits, was sent to Cork, Ireland. Shortly after enlisting and being in Cork, Bent did not take very well to life in the British Army, with everlasting drills giving him an intense disgust for the routine of barrack yard instruction. Bent wanted more. Upon a stroll down the Cork Marina, a miserable Bent found a Boston ship. Upon further inspection, Bent found the skipper to be Captain Can, an old acquaintance from his time in the US Navy. That evening, Bent quietly snuck away from the British Army barracks in Cork and boarded the Captain Can's ship. Bent immediately began to revel in the joy of being a free man once again. Nevertheless, when around 300 miles off the Irish land, a terrible storm hit and furious winds began to blow. The ship sprang a leak. Immediate panic set in, and after days of using distress signals throughout the storm, a Boston vessel coming from the West Indies saved Bent and his crew. However, Bent's new ship was heading to the wrong side of the Atlantic, and he ended up in the Mariners of Glasgow. When in Glasgow, Bent was arrested as a deserter and taken to the military barracks in Cork, where he was tried by court-martial and sentenced to 84 days in prison. After serving his prison sentence, the main-born British Army soldier was reluctantly shipped off to India with his regiment. Bent landed in Bombay, India, and for some time did garrison duty at Pune. The 57th Regiment went on to spend just over two years in India before hearing news of a serious war in New Zealand. The war being spoke of was the Taranaki Wars, which had begun in 1860 when a growing faction of the Maori, worried that the British rule would destroy their way of life, rebelled with force. In response, the British government had confiscated vast amounts of Maori land. Naturally, this led to further fighting between the Maori and the British government. As a result, in 1861, Bent and his regiment sailed for a land spoken to be a much more pleasant place to live in than India. Bent finally saw his life beginning to change for the better. After 89 days at sea, Bent and his fellow soldiers in the 57th Regiment finally arrived in Auckland Harbour. Throughout his time in both the US Navy and the British Army, Bent's disciplinary record was disappointing in the eyes of his seniors. Between June 1860 and June 1865, Bent piled up an extensive list of offences, including drunkenness, thievery, and insubordination. A sergeant of the 57th Regiment 
described Bent as a man repeatedly punished for acts of petty thievery and drunkenness. It is said that Bent drank even more to cope with the damaging conditions of combat in the bush of New Zealand. His general disobedience and drunkenness ultimately resulted in a prison sentence in Wellington, New Zealand. This was after he received, by his own account, 25 lashes in front of his own company for refusal to obey an order. Following this turbulent experience, Bent was finally finished and decided to desert the British Army in June 1865 while serving in Taranaki. Pretending he wanted to bathe, Bent left his soldiers of the 57th Regiment and made his way to a nearby river. He tried to swim through it, but found the current to be way too strong. Instead, he bashed and cut his way through the ferns along the riverbank until he was exhausted and couldn't go any further. He soon encountered a local Maori chief of the Nati Ruanui Iwi on a pony in South Taranaki. Take me with you, Bent begged. After a little consideration, the chief asked, What's your name, Pakiha? This Maori term refers to the white inhabitants of New Zealand. Kimball Bent, he replied. Too hard, said the chief. We give you more better name, good Maori name, if my tribe don't kill you. The Maori tribe did not kill Bent. In fact, Bent was kept as a servant and protected, eventually becoming accepted as part of the local tribe and forcibly married to a native woman. His attraction to combat led him to fall in with Tito Kawara's followers in 1867 and Bent fought with them against the British in what became the Tito Kawara's War. Bent remained with the Maori forces for the rest of the war until their defeat in 1869. While at Otapawa village, Bent mainly helped the Maori to strengthen their defences and to aid healing their troops. While tending for the wounded, Bent noted how the Maori successfully treated gunshot and bayonet wounds with the fluid produced by boiling flax roots. Additionally, Bent fully immersed himself in the Maori life, observing and participating in the rituals of Pai Marire, as well as helping in the Hao Hao war effort. Bent also met other deserters and captives, including Humphrey Murphy from the 57th, who was later executed as he planned to murder a chief who had treated him bitterly. It is understood that any deserter had to earn their position within the camp, and Bent definitely did so, proving time and time again that his allegiance was with the Maori and not the British army. Bent was first taken before the prophet Te Ua Haumene, who was described by Bent as a strongly built man in his 40s, who carried a tayaha and wore European clothing. Bent maintained that Te Ua took him under his wing, shared local food with him, gave him a flax cloak and even some tobacco. After spending time with Te Ua Haumene, and then some time with Tito Te Hanata Ua, Bent was handed on to the Maori chief Rup following the war, where he stayed from 1866 until 1878. During his time with Rup, Bent was given Rup's daughter Rihi for a wife, after Bent cured Rup's son of a serious illness. Rihi and Bent lived together happily for nearly three years and had one child together. However, their child died, with Rihi herself dying soon after. Following this tragedy, the records of Bent's life are jumbled and ambiguous. It is widely agreed and most suggest that he continued to live among the Maori at Rukumawana, where Rup's granddaughter became his wife. During this time, it is understood that Bent spent the best of his later years working in several trades, including a builder, fisherman, tattooist, and confectioner. This is supported by an isolated report in 1886 describing him 
baking and decorating six large wedding cakes and 60 smaller ones for the opening of a meeting house at Hokorima. Bent remained a wanted deserter, with a price on his head for numerous years. However, eventually the authorities stopped looking for him. It is suggested by some that relatives got in contact with Bent and tried to persuade him to return to Maine. However, he refused to go until he could establish his innocence of the charges made against him. Bent always believed he did the right thing until his final days, and he managed to win some public sympathy through the efforts of James Cohen. In 1903, New Zealand journalist James Cohen met an old man with an astonishing story. He was American, yet Cohen said that after decades of living amongst the Maori and avoiding British and other European settlements, he was barely able to speak English. This old man was Kimball Bent. After believing his life story should be heard around the world, James Cohen wrote a book entitled The Adventures of Kimball Bent, a story of wildlife in the New Zealand bush. His tale was verified with survivors from both sides of the conflict. On the 22nd of May 1916, in Waidau Hospital, New Zealand, Kimball Bent died. Following his death, and majorly due to Cohen's book, The Adventures of Kimball Bent. Bent was fictionalised by both Maury Shadbolt in the 1990s historical novel Monday's Warriors, as well as the 2011 graphic novel Kimball Bent Malcontent, The Wild Adventures of a Runaway Soldier in the Old Time New Zealand by Chris Gross. Even to this day, Bent remains in the minds of those with an interest in histories of both the British Army and the Maori, and is remembered for his interesting life and characteristics of a true individual. To anyone who made it to the end of the video, I want to say thanks very much for watching and I hope you enjoyed, and also let me know what you thought down below of the compilation format. If you've already heard some, one of these stories before, I apologise and hopefully you enjoyed re-watching it. I hope all of you had a Merry Christmas and I hope you all have a very Happy New Year. And if you have any other suggestions, be sure to leave them down below in the comments. Anyway, that's all from me, so I'll see all of you in the next Forgotten Life. Thanks.